I have the greatest pleasure in introducing the moderator for our next session, the former British ambassador to Cairo, Sir Derek Plumley. When we had our very first uh, conference in 2006, um, Sir Derek was the ambassador there and very kindly launched the book on our conference in the embassy the following year, just before he stepped down. Uh, this session is called Reflections on the 1919 Independence Movement. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Sir Derek Plumley. Thank you, Noel. It's, it's good to be back uh, addressing another major Egyptian uh, marker in time, so to speak. Um, and thanks very much to the Middle East Institute and all the rest of you for, for organizing this. Uh, it's my privilege, and we're running a little late, so I won't speak at enormous length, but to uh, open this session and to welcome uh, Munir Fakhri Abdel Noor, who is our next speaker. He's uh, a friend. I guess he's a friend of quite a few people in this room. Uh, and uh, he has had a very distinguished career uh, as a banker, as an entrepreneur, as a politician. He was the Secretary General of the new WAF Party in the 2000s. As a minister, he was uh, Minister of, uh, of Tourism uh, after what I will call the, the January 2011 revolution. And uh, he was uh, a minister again uh, of uh, trade, industry, and investment from 2013 to 2015. Um, like one or two others in this room, and I can look around and I can see them, he has uh, family connections, for a family link uh, to the subject that we're discussing today, uh, the 1919 revolution and the sort of turbulent events that occurred after that up to 1925. His grandfather, Fakhri Abdel Noor, uh, was an activist, uh, a leader amongst the leaders of the nationalist movement. He became close to Saad. He was imprisoned in 1922 by our forefathers. Uh, and uh, uh, he went on to write his memoirs, uh, which uh, uh, a massive work, which was introduced by Mustafa Amin, who um, uh, was the doyen, I suppose, really, of uh, Egyptian journalists and editors in the 20th century, and who had grown up in the home of Saad Zaglul. And uh, uh, Mustafa Amin called Fakhri Abdel Noor a new Jabarti. I like the Djiboutti who'd uh, described the Na Napoleon's adventures in Egypt in similar uh, chronicling form. Uh, Munir is a prime mover behind the things that are happening in Egypt to mark the uh, 100th anniversary of the revolution. Uh, and I know he has been very keen to link that uh, commemoration, so to speak, with whatever was happening here, which seems to me, since this is very much an Anglo-Egyptian story, uh, uh, important. Uh, he's promised to tell us a little bit about those events, but his theme, as you know, and he's written a long paper on the subject, uh, is Copts in the 1919 revolution, an exceptional participation in Egyptian political life. And he's going to summarize that for us, I think, really, and speak to the main themes thereof. Uh, and we will be returning to the subject, I, I notice, again uh, tomorrow afternoon. So it, it, it uh, repeats itself. It's important. I mean, the Copts are uh, Christians. Are, you know, who knows? Because there isn't a precise figure, but 10%, roughly, of the population of Egypt. But politically, they have rarely pulled their full weight on, even, that weight even, on the, the Egyptian political stage. Uh, the focus before the First World War, immediately before it, was very much on Coptic grievances, and it all crystallized in the uh, a conference that was held in Asyut in 1911, when they set out demands, which were not well received by the British, I have to say, or at least by Elden Gorst. Uh, and afterwards, the theme has recurred from time to time in Egyptian political life. And Munir, in fact, is a symbol in one way of this because he is actually one of the few uh, Copts 
to be directly elected in recent decades to the Egyptian parliament, which is not to say that there are not. Another one is in the audience, actually, we are doing really well. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but there aren't very many such people. Um, anyway, 1919 uh, to 24, 25 is a very different story. Uh, Copts are amongst the leaders of the nationalist movement. The cross and the crescent became the flag of, uh, of, the, of the revolution. There were meetings in mosques and churches and priests and imams were seen holding hands and making speeches together. It was a different uh, message, a message of al-wahd al-wataniya, which has continued, actually the images at least, have continued to resonate in Egyptian politics since then, really countering, it seems to me, some of the negatives that I've already mentioned. But it's not for me to describe all of that, it's for Munir, who knows the subject intimately, and he's going to tell us just how different it was, uh, and what happened, and why, and then we can do Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Derek, for your, this introduction. Uh, let me warn you, I'm not a historian, I'm not an academic, I'm merely an avid uh, reader of uh, uh, contemporary Egyptian history and a born Wavdist. So I think I know my subject and I'll try to, uh, to relate to you uh, my opinions. Uh, I thank you very much for inviting me to attend this uh, conference. It is an honor for me uh, to be in this distinguished assembly and it's a great opportunity to meet uh, friends I haven't seen for quite a while. Uh, for us, uh, it is a very important event the, the celebration of the centennial of the 1919 revolution. And we made it a point uh, to celebrate it, if only to uh, remind Egyptians of the values of this movement that uh, has called for independence, democracy, respect for the constitution, for the rule of law, and for secularism. It's a movement that has witnessed the birth of uh, the Egyptian feminist movement and the renaissance of fine arts. And this is why uh, the Ministry of Culture has organized an international conference that was held in Cairo between the 16th and 18th of uh, March that was extremely well attended by scholars, politicians. Uh, parallelly, there are several events that have been organized uh, including uh, uh, exhibitions of fine arts, photography, music, all related to the 1919 revolution. I must also tell you that Ibrahim uh, uh, Malim, who's here, has uh, published a series of books, all books uh, concerning the 1919 revolution. All universities, all universities in Egypt have, have uh, uh, celebrated uh, this uh, event. The Waft Party, of course, is doing uh, his job. And at the end of the year, Bibliotheca Alexandrina is organizing uh, a conference that will focus on uh, the influence of the 1919 revolution regionally uh, in uh, neighboring countries, Sudan, Iraq, uh, Palestine, Syria, and the Maghreb, and also the relations uh, between uh, the Egyptian independence movements and other movements, including, uh, by the way, uh, Ireland. As you know, as you might know, uh, Saad Zaghloul had a correspondence with uh, De Valera and, uh, in order to coordinate uh, their fight against the British uh, Empire, the British rule. Uh, the conference also uh, is going to discuss the relationship of uh, the 1919 revolution and its influence on the Congress party, more specifically on Mahatma Gandhi in particular, who was uh, admiring uh, Saad Zaghloul and uh, thought that Saad Zaghloul uh, succeeded to unify Egyptians in their quest for independence, whereas he personally failed to unify Indians of different creeds. And uh, 
In fact, the active participation of Copts alongside their Muslim countrymen during the five-year period is precisely uh, the subject of my talk to you. But what I'm going to uh, talk about is the contrast between uh, what happened those five years and uh, the place of Copts in Egyptian politics and public life in previous and subsequent uh, periods. The contrast is huge. And it raises a question, how and why? Why was it that way in 1919? And it wasn't, neither before nor after. I'll attempt to answer the question. But let me start uh, from the beginning very quickly and very briefly. Through the 18th century and uh, the beginning of the 19th, uh, and even during the enlightened rule of Muhammad Ali, uh, Copts were zimmis. Uh, they used to pay the jizya, uh, in return of which they were exempt from conscription in the army. Exceptionally, individuals uh, uh, were accepted in the administration and uh, raised in uh, the Egyptian bureaucracy and held important uh, uh, positions uh, such as uh, Girgis and Ibrahim Gohari, the two brothers, and Mahalim Ghali uh, during the, the, the rule of Muhammad Ali. But starting the second half of uh, the, the uh, 19th century, Copts started to recoup progressively uh, their citizenship, uh, citizenship rights. Uh, in 1854, Said Pasha the fourth son of Muhammad Ali, uh, issued a decree abolishing the jizya. And as a result, Copts were admitted in the army as soldiers. And he issued a second uh, decree uh, giving the uh, uh, ownership rights to the peasants' uh, ownership rights on the land. And as a result, Copts started to, to own agricultural land. Under the Khedive Ismail, Copts were allowed to enter state schools, to be sent abroad to study at the expense of the state, then were accepted as officers in the army. It was a big, big step. And in 1866, were appointed in the uh, Chamber of Notables, precisely what is called Maglis Shur and Noab, which is the first attempt to have a parliament in contemporary Egyptian history. Two Copts were appointed. By the way, uh, I have a long, the paper is much longer than what I'll say uh, verbally, and all the names are in the paper. In 1882, Copts, like their patriarch, uh, supported the Arabi revolt and rallied around the slogan, Egypt for Egyptians, Masr al -Masri. And uh, as you know, the revolt ended up by the British occupation of the country. In 1893, under the uh, reign of uh, Khedif Abbas Helmi, the first Copt, I mean Copt, not Christian, was named minister. It was Boutros Ghali who was named minister of uh, uh, finance. Later, he was appointed Minister of Foreign Affairs. In 1908, he was Prime Minister. During the reign of Abbas Helmi, the public debate flourished. In 1913, there were 282 newspapers published in Egypt. Among those newspapers, there were two Coptic newspapers, Misr and Al Watan, but they did not really, uh, they were not active in the public debate. They concentrated on Coptic issues, uh, grievances, demands, and so on. At the same time, several politi political parties were formed. Again, Copts did not, were not stimulated uh, uh, by uh, the, the political parties. Uh, Wisa Wasif, a prominent Copt, uh, joined uh, Hezbe Watani, but uh, Hezbe Watani that was formed by uh, Mustafa Kamil, but had cold feet when this party uh, started to use uh, fanatic discourse, uh, very pan-Islamist pan and so on. Uh, on the other hand, uh, 
rich land, Coptic landowners from Upper Egypt joined Hezb al Ummah. Hezb al Ummah, that was the, the penseur behind Hezb al Ummah, was Ahmed Rudfi Sayyid, the architect of Egyptian liberalism. Uh, a number of rich landowners joined Hezb al Ummah, but were never active, really active, in the organization of the party or on the, uh, the political scene. Names like uh, Bushra and Sinut Hanna. By the way, Sinut Hanna is an important name that will follow uh, through the five years. Uh, the uh, Andraus Bishara and Fakhri Abdunur, who was uh, one of the founder of El Garida, which is the newspaper behind that uh, political party. In 1913, Abbas Helmi signed an organic law uh, to uh, uh, establish a legislative assembly, El Gamayat Tashriya. Four Copts were uh, appointed. One of them was, again, uh, Sinot Han. In the winter, uh, the, the, uh, in July 1914, the war uh, erupted. The Legislative Assembly was uh, suspended. Martial law uh, proclaimed. And on December 18th, Brit the British government declared Egypt a British protectorate. A chapter in the history of the country was turned, during which Copts succeeded to regain most of the citizenship rights. However, with the exception of a few individuals, Copts did not participate in the political and public life of Egypt. They were marginalized. In fact, they sidelined side themselves. They felt alien when Egypt was part of the Ottoman Empire and when the national movement promoted pan-Islamism and did not really get involved in the public debate or in the national debate. When the Coptic intelligentsia uh, in November 1918 uh, got to know about the meeting between Saad Zaghloul and uh, Abdelaziz Fahmi and uh, uh, met uh, Reginald Wingut to ask for, uh, to go to, to participate in a Versailles uh, conference, and Saad Zaghloul was forming the, uh, the WAFT, they noticed that there, was, there were no uh, Coptic names in the WAFT. Three of them, three of those intelligentsia, uh, namely uh, Wissa Wasif, Taufi Andraus, and Fakhri Abdunur, went to meet uh, Saad Zaghloul to tell him in many words, in so many words, that nationalism is not or should not be the, uh, be monopolized by Muslims. And they proposed to have the name of uh, Wasif Butros Ghali included in the Waft. Saad Zaghloul uh, welcomed this proposition, included in the Waft Wasif Butros Ghali, and in addition, included Sinot Hanna and uh, George Khayat. Before taking the oath, George Khayat asked point blank Saad Zaghloul, what is the position of Copts in that new order, in that new independent Egypt? Saad Zaghloul told him uh, they have equivalent rights and equivalent obligations like Muslims. Suddenly, everything changed. Copts rose to the front lines of political and public life of Egypt. When the revolution erupted, when Saad Zaghloul was exiled on March the 9th, Copts were in the front line of uh, street demonstrations. As a matter of fact, the first uh, casualty that was killed was a young Coptic student by the name of Meher Hafiz Amin. When Saad Zaghloul was released and uh, traveled to France to, with uh, hoping to participate in uh, uh, the peace conference, uh, he was joined by uh, Wasif Boutrosghali, Sinot Hanna, Gorgi Khayat, Wisa Wasif, Aziz Mansi, George Domani, I mean, who were, uh, and uh, they were there, they were present, and stayed with him. When uh, the uh, employees, the government employees, decided to have a general strike, the leaders of the general strike were Sadat Hanin from the Ministry of Agriculture, Dr. Nagib Iskander from the Ministry of Health, the judge Salama Mikhail, uh, a judge representing the, the, the Ministry of... Uh. In April 19, Copts rushed to participate in the WAFT Central Committee that was formed to uh, uh, liaise between the leadership and uh, the members of uh, the WAFT. 
and uh, the leaders of uh, the, the leaders, uh, the Coptic leaders that went into that central committee uh, were Mor Oshana, Tawfiq Dos, the Kamil Botros, Habib Khayat, Fahmi Wisya, and many, many other names. Later, in April 1921, two years later, when the Prime Minister Adli Yakan objected to the organization by the government employees of a reception to honor Saad Zaghlour, who arrived after two years of absence between being in, between Paris and uh, London. It was, again, Saad Hineen, Salama Mikhail, Nagib Iskandar, and Makram Abed who challenged the prime minister. In fact, the reception took place, but the organizers were tried by the disciplinary court. Disciplinary court. Cops were again in the front lines to welcome Saad Zaghroun when he took that uh, trip to Upper Egypt. And despite the very heavy land, very heavy hand, hand of uh, the police and of the administration, they were there everywhere in Menya, in Asyut, in Sohag, in Gerga, in Ena, and so on. They were in the front lines to receive Sadzakhrul. And they were there to bear the consequences of their enthusiasm. Uh, Sinot Hanna and Makram Abed were exiled with Saad Zaghlul to Seychelles and then Saad Zaghlul to Gibraltar. Uh, Wasif Ghali, Mor Oshanna, Wisa Wasif, George Khayat were uh, tried and sentenced with Hamad al Basil. Salama Mikhail, Raghab Iskandar, and Fakhri Abdunur were arrested and jailed with Al Masri Saadi in July 1922. Between May and June 1923, when the leaders of the Waft were released, coming back from jail, from the exile, the higher committee of the Waft was constituted, and it was constituted of 26 members, nine of which were Copts, nine out of 26. But Copts were also the most active and probably the most competent when it had to do with contacts with foreigners. In Paris in 1919, Wasif Ghali, Sinut Hanna, and Wisa Wasif, the three of them, perfect Francophone, contacted the French press, the opinion leaders, such as Anatole France and many others. They wrote articles that were published in Le Journal des Deux Mondes, in uh, La Revue des Deux Mondes, in Le Journal, and uh, with a view to raise the attention of the French public opinion uh, on, around the Egyptian uh, problem. In fact, they also uh, wrote letters to uh, Georges Clemenceau, who was prime minister, and obviously the letter was signed by Saad Zarlour, but Clemenceau uh, never answered. Uh, and they succeeded to uh, get the support of part of the French press, mainly the socialist press, and in particular of uh, l'Humanité and of Le Populaire, supporting the uh, Egyptian uh, cause. Similarly, it was Makram Abid who went to, in 1921 to uh, uh, England uh, to follow up on the negotiations between Ad Yakan and uh, Lord Curzon, the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs. And while there, he also contacted opinion leaders, writers, uh, and uh, politicians from both the Liberal and the Labour Party. Uh, he uh, published uh, articles mainly in the Daily Herald, among, among many uh, other newspapers, and he was in close contact with journalists and writers, including George Bernard Shaw. It was Fakhri Abdenour suggested uh, 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 to uh, uh, Saad Zaghloul on the 14th of July uh, 1921, on the occasion of the French National Day, uh, to uh, go to attend, to crash, as a matter of fact, the uh, reception uh, to uh, uh, send a message uh, to uh, the, uh, foreign, the foreigners in Egypt uh, that the nation, Egyptian national movement was neither fanatic nor xenophobic, and uh, the message was that it will preserve the interests of foreigners in Egypt. It was, finally, it was Sinot Hanna and Moros Hanna uh, who received and invited the liberal members of the British Parliament who arrived in Egypt in September 1921 on a fact-finding mission at the instigation of uh, Makram Abed, who was uh, there, who was then in, uh, in England. And Copts 
were definitely the most faithful uh, to the cause and to the rule personally. I mean, each time that was there was a problem and uh, 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 and a, a problem between the members of the Waft, they stood by the rule. It was the case when uh, members of the Waft in Paris disappointed by uh, the uh, recognition of uh, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, uh, of the uh, uh, British protectorate of uh, Egypt, uh, disappointed a lot of the members left, the one who stood with the Copts with uh, Saad. Again in 1920, after the uh, negotiations between Zerloul and Lord Milner in London uh, broke, uh, disappointed the members left, the Copts remained with uh, Zerloul uh, in uh, London and back to Paris. Precisely, it was Wasif Ghali and Sinot Hanna together with uh, Ali Meher. When the controversy started uh, within the Waft in Cairo around the, around the presidency of the delegation to negotiate uh, with uh, Lord Curzon the, between, and the choice was between Adliak and the Prime Minister and uh, Saad Zahroul, uh, Saad Zahroul insisted to be the uh, negotiator because he had the mandate from the people and he was preserving the right of the people to uh, uh, to speak and to, to, to have a position. Uh, members of the Waft uh, left and the, those who stood by Saad were again the Copts in addition to uh, Nahas. And Copts were the most extremist, and I'm using the word uh, used by uh, uh, the British, uh, uh, I mean, this is the British description. They were the, ex the extremists. And uh, I take as an example Sinot Hanna in particular, uh, who uh, was uh, writing uh, articles in the newspapers. Uh, strangely enough, uh, in the uh, Coptic newspaper that used to be a Coptic newspaper, the Mist and who used to concentrate on Coptic issues and Coptic affairs, suddenly had become the mouthpiece of uh, the Waft, of the national movement. Bref, uh, Sinot Hanna uh, uh, starting, started to uh, uh, accuse and attack uh, the Prime Minister, Mohammed Said, uh, because he was uh, taking legal measures against government employees who uh, uh, led the, the strike, the general strike, in April 1919. So he accused him and wrote an article uh, titled In the Attahim, uh, copying uh, Jacques of uh, Emile Zola, and uh, to the point that uh, Said had uh, to resign. He accused, he attacked also uh, the successor of Mohammed Said, and successor of Mohammed Said was a Coptic Prime Minister, Yusuf Wahaba, uh, because Yusuf Wahaba was ready to uh, uh, receive Lord Milner uh, in Cairo, uh, whereas the uh, national movement had decided to boycott uh, uh, the Milner delegation. And uh, he, uh, uh, he attacked um, uh, Yusuf Wahaba vehemently, and uh, in a series of articles uh, titled Al Wataniya Dinuna wa Istiklal Hayatuna, meaning pat patriotism is our religion and independence is our life. I mean, the, 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 his speech was so inflammatory that it inspired a young Coptic student, Elian Yusuf Saad, to attempt to assassinate uh, Yusuf Wahaba. Uh, in July 1920, uh, Abdurrahman Fahmi, who was the Secretary General of the Central uh, Committee of the Waft, was accused uh, of, was arrested and charged with conspiracy of attempting to overthrow the government. He was tried along with nine other uh, Copts. In return, Zahloul was showed his appreciation and expressed his gratitude to Copts in many ways. It is true when they came uh, to, 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 to propose to include Wasif Ghali, not only he welcomed Wasif Ghali, but he included Sinut Hanna and uh, George Hayat. But after two years of absence between Paris and London, when Zahroul came back, the first thing he did uh, uh, on April the 6th, 
1921 is to visit the tomb of a Coptic nationalist who had succumbed to the bullets of the uh, uh, police during demonstrations. On April 7, he visited uh, the Coptic patriarch, patriarch Kirolus V. In May, on the occasion of Easter, Zarloul visited the tomb of Botrus Bacharelli, then went to greet Coptic leaders of the Waft in their houses to wish them a happy Easter. In September 1921, he attended the wedding of Yusuf Botrus Reli, the brother of Wasif Reli and the grandfather of this one, of this Yusuf Botrus Reli, uh, uh, a wedding that was attended by uh, uh, liberal MPs, the liberal MPs visiting Egypt. Later, in September, Zarloul presided over a ceremony on the occasion of the Coptic New Year, Eid al Naruz, and he delivered uh, a speech emphasizing the importance of unity, of unity between Copts and Muslims. In December 1923, while preparing for the uh, parliamentary elections, uh, Zarloul was very worried that his uh, uh, Coptic colleagues would not succeed, would not make it uh, in the elections, and asked uh, Sheikh Mustafa Ayati to go and support uh, Sinut Hanna in, uh, in Asyut, Fakhri Abdenur in Girga, and uh, 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 Makram Abid in, uh, in, in Qina uh, to support them in face of potential fanatic Islamic claims. In the parliamentary elections, uh, 16, repeat, 16 Copts uh, won seats out of 214, some of them an entirely uh, Muslim constituency, uh, a far cry from previous periods when they had to be appointed as representative of a minority. In fact, they were not perceived as minority anymore. Finally, when Zaghloul formed his cabinet in January 1924, he appointed two Coptic ministers, Wasser Botros Reddy as Minister of Foreign Affairs and Moros Hanna as Minister of Public uh, Works, notwithstanding King Fouad's reservation, uh, who reminded, he, reminded him that customs entitled Copts to only one uh, ministerial post. But Zaghloul's appreciation and recognition of Copts' role in the revolt cannot have been the only reason for Coptic enthusiasm and involvement in political and public life of the country. Some argue that Copts were particularly active during this period because they resented the fact that the British didn't sympathize with them as a minority. And there is truth to the British lack of sympathy for Copts, as illustrated by Edward Lane, the famous Orientalist, who, uh, and the writer uh, of the famous uh, book, Modern Egyptians, an account of the manners and custom of modern Egyptians. Lane was extremely harsh describing uh, Copts. Uh, I'm co quoting one of the most remarkable traits in the character of Copts is their bigotry. They bear a bitter hater, hatred to all other Christians. They are generally speaking of a sullen temper extremely avaricious and abominable dissemblers, liars. <laughs> Unfortunately, Lane's defamation of the Copts has been passed to, uh, on to innumerable Britons who came after him, including Lord Cromer, Eldon Gorst, I guess uh, Derek Plumley is an exception uh, <laughs> since, he, <laughs> since he married a Copt, but anyhow. <laughs> Dr. Butler, Dr. Alfred Butler, the historian, uh, the author of uh, The Arab Conquest of Egypt, uh, confirmed in his introduction to Kirakus Mikhail 1911 uh, book, Copts and Muslims under British Control, that policies and practices of the British government in Egypt favored Muslims at the expense of Copts. It is likely that Copts' active participation in the fight for independence was a reaction to the lack of, of British empathy for them. But the most important factor, I believe, that raised Coptic enthusiasm for the national movement was the secular character of the 1919 revolution. A secular character that emphasized the unity of all Egyptians, regardless of ethnicity or religion. 
It was, I believe, the definition and clear formulation and expression of the Egyptian identity that was the major reason for the active involvement of Copts in the, in the political life of the, of the country. In fact, since the beginning of the 19th century, Egypt was in search of its own identity. Under Muhammad Ali, Said, and Ismail, Egypt wanted, Egypt wanted to affirm its own identity away from the Ottoman Empire, but it failed because the balance of power was not in its favor. Then in 1882, although the Horabi revolt raised the slogan, Egypt for Egyptian, it was unable to properly express Egyptian nationalism and lost its way due to xenophobic sentiments. Then came Mustafa Kamil. And here, I guess, I'm answering the question that was raised earlier. Uh, then came Mustafa Kamil, who, in order to safeguard Egypt's independence, vis-a-vis -vis the British colonialists, promoted Egypt's allegiance to the Ottoman Empire and his successors promoted pan-Islamism. In contrast to those movements, the Waft inherited the secular and liberal thoughts of Hezb al-Ummah. And like Lutfi Sayyid strongly believed that Egypt is a nation by itself, Egypt is Egyptian. The discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun in 1922 helped foster Egyptian identity and gave rise to a movement of pharaonism, which became a manifestation of Egyptian nationalism. Copts, claiming to be the direct descendants of pharaohs, had to be at the vanguard of this movement, which portrayed Egypt as a Mediterranean nation with links to Europe. Later, through the 20th century, several events contributed to reinforcement of the pan-Arab and the pan-Islamist political forces and change, changed the course of the Egyptian national movement. In the 1930s, the nationalistic and fascistic Young Egypt Society led by Ahmed Hussein, while advocating British withdrawal from Egypt and the Sudan, promised to unite Arab, the Arab world under the leadership of Egypt. At the same time, Pharaonism was condemned by Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, whose doctrine, like uh, it was said earlier, whose doctrine does not recognize nation states and aims at unifying Muslim countries under the Islamic rule based on Quran and Sharia. After 1952, Nasser played up Egypt's Arab identity and promoted a policy of pan Pan-Arabism, pan arguing that Egypt, that all Arab states should unite under, the leadership, under his leadership to face the political and economic threats of imperialism. Nasser's successor, Anwar Sadat, confronted by Nasserists and communist challenges, relied on the support of various Islamic movements. He promoted Egypt's Muslim identity. In 1980, he amended the constitution promulgated in 1971 to stipulate that Sharia, Sharia law is the main source of legislation. Under his rule, Saudi Arabian influence of dominated media and public education. It had a deep impact on Egyptian culture to the point that Islam was portrayed as the cornerstone of Egyptian identity. And once again, Copts were sidelined from, political, from the political realm. In conclusion, I would argue that throughout the years, Copts have only been inspired and motivated by secular movements based on Egyptian nationalism and Egyptian identity. The political and cultural environment of the period going from November 1918 to January 1924 encouraged Egyptians to raise the secular slogan, religion is for God, and the nation is for all, at Dinulillah wal Watan Gamia, it had the extraordinary effect of pushing Copts out of the sidelines to the forefront of the political and public life in Egypt. This made this period a unique one in contemporary Egyptian history. Thank you.
I will then ask you a question. Do that. All right. <laughs> I have two. One is, why did you choose the subject? And what, what is it particularly that drove you to this? And secondly, I'm, if we're looking at the, the broader picture, I mean, you're saying only in the context of uh, this sort of purely secular, uh, as it was almost, uh, political environment, was this degree of participation possible? Aren't you actually rather writing cops out of political life in Egypt when maybe more compromises had to be made? Now, let me answer the second question. No, I'm not writing off cops. When I'm talking of Coptic participation, I'm talking of the community participation. I'm not talking of individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, individuals were all, always there. Uh, was it uh, window dressing? Was it uh, the uh, again uh, the, uh, 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 the, the the rise of uh, a competent person within the administration within the bureaucracy? It was before and after. It was never uh, the participation of a full community in the streets, in the government, in the political uh, parties, in the political forces. In literature, in, uh, in fine arts, in, uh, in cinema, in, I mean, the, 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 I mean, everywhere. Look at, it has changed. And it has changed, I think, it is the result of lack of secularism. Again, I repeat, uh, cops in general. It's not necessarily my opinion. I'm just describing uh, what has happened and what is happening. Uh, they are not enthusiastic when you're talking of pan-Islamism. They feel left apart. Mm -hmm. uh, they are very doubtful when you're talking of pan-Arabism. They are not sure, or it is not the majority of Copts that believe that they are Arabs. It's a fact. Uh, why did I choose this subject? I've, I've always been struck by the fact of this active participation during that period. And then when you look around, for instance, there was a comparison between 1919 and 1952. In 1952, uh, the revolution started by a coup d'etat made by uh, 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 army officers. And it was the free officers, Zubat al -Ahra. They were 400. None of them was a cop. I mean, Something is wrong. Something has changed. I'm sorry. Something has changed. And this is precisely what I'm trying to emphasize. And this change has uh, sidelined uh, the Copts from the political life. Yeah, they might be brilliant businessmen. They might be excellent traders. They could be, they could be good diplomats. But um, they out. They are out of the political life. They can have brilliant minister of finance, possible, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, they are not in political life. Thanks. And if they are, they're an exception. It's, it would be an exception. Dr. Mengti. Thank you very much. Uh, it, it, it just. Uh... Do you believe that I'm a cop myself, like you? But didn't you believe there is an element of what I call Coptic apathy? Coptic to what? Apathy. 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 To participate in political life and activity, to be blamed. And would you agree with me that the great party, of Wavd party, was basically near the end before the 1952 revolution, was nearly destroyed by a Copt as well? I misheard the last part of the question. Can you repeat it? I, please raise your voice, Dr. Magdi, because I'm, okay. I have a problem. No, I, I'm talking about the Great Waft Party. Near the end, the difference between one single Copt and Nahas Basha have led really to the demise of the Waft Party. Uh, possible, of course. Uh, uh, mind you, um, I'm talking about a five-year period. I, I didn't go any further. Because starting the 1930s, the mood changed. The mood changed. And uh, uh, when, when Makram left the Waft, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it did destroy the Waft. 
It did destroy the world because the, the, the message itself was destroyed. And the message disappeared. Now, are you talking about apathy? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I mean they were not invited, and they, 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 not invi they were not invited in the political realm, and they, they, they did not fight to get into that political realm. Thank you. Um, Bob? Bob Springwood. Thanks. You mentioned uh, the patriarch. Is it on? You mentioned the patriarch only once in your presentation. And were you to have discussed events in 2011 or 2013, presumably that figure would have come up uh, more frequently. And I wonder, therefore, if you could address the role of the patriarch and the, uh, the institution of the Coptic Church uh, in your five-year period as compared to the present day. Thank you for your question. Uh, first of all, uh, since you mentioned 2011 and 2013, uh, I, because I wanted to save time, so I just skipped a, a page. But if I have to be fair, I would tell you that Copts were present in 2011 uh, uh, revolution or uh, whatever you want to call it. They were there. They were in the streets, despite the fact that the patriarch, uh, Pope uh, Shenouda, with, who's, who's a, was a huge man, I mean, a very strong personality, uh, asked Copts not to get involved. And nothing doing. They were there in the street, but I mean, it was such a short period that uh, I would not, yeah, it would not overrule what I'm saying that the five years between 18 and 24 is an exceptional period and it was never repeated. It was very, very short. Uh, uh, the, the patriarch, the patriarch Kirolos, uh, the, uh, the patriarch of uh, the 1919 revolution uh, was very much. Uh, no, no, I'm talking of the fifth. I'm talking of the fifth. the fifth of the 1919 revolution was very, very close to Sadzak rule, as a matter of fact. As a matter of fact, they died the same year, in 1927, and they were very close. And uh, the visits, uh, the visit, I mentioned one visit to Sazarul to the patriarch. He uh, visited him uh, several times. Uh, it was the same, yeah, it was the same pat patriarch who supported uh, 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 the, the Arabi revolt in 1882. But the character of the church was somewhat different, wasn't it, I think, in terms of its authority and the relative weight between the, 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 the leaders of the community, the, the, leaders, the, the, leaders, the of the, leaders of the community yeah, and the patriarch. Yeah, yeah. The, the leaders of the community then, mind you, it was the church was a poor church. And it was led, it's a question of financial ability, and it was led by uh, the civilians, uh, uh, the, 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 Cop the, the Coptic leaders, the civilian Coptic leaders. It's not the case today. Today, the Coptic church is a rich uh, church as a result of uh, the, the Coptic diaspora. And uh, obviously, it gives much more weight to uh, the Coptic nomenclatura, church nomenclatura. I think, honestly, I'm receiving strong signals from... Uh, the floor here, <laughs> that we're going to miss lunch if we, get, uh, if we actually extend further. Can I take one question? One question? One question. Uh, okay, the uh, well, gentleman here. Okay, that's it. And then we uh, I'm just intrigued, and I am not um, disputing the fact uh, uh, about the marginalizing of the Copts uh, after 1952. However, the Pan-Arabism at least from the Levant, was actually That's a right. movement by the Christian anti-pan-Islamism. Absolutely. And in a way, Nasser, after the first period, was fighting the pan-Islamism view and concentrating more on pan-Arabism, and both were defeated later. Mm. But 
uh, why is it that the Copts of Egypt did not link the same ideas that came from Syria, Lebanon, and whatever? You, you, know, the, you know the answer. The national movements in the Levant was against the Ottoman Empire, was against the Caliphate. So uh, uh, their, their, uh, their claim was the Pan-Arabism as opposed to the Pan-Islamism. And pan egyptianism if you want, in 1919. Uh, the, 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 yeah. the, the, the Egyptian national movement was facing the, uh, uh, the, the, the British Empire. It was not f facing at all the, uh, uh, the, the Ottoman Empire. And, and in face of uh, uh, the, the, the British Empire, it was Egyptianism that was uh, uh, put, uh, I mean, that was the claim. But it, it's not only, I'm sorry about that, Makram Abid and his fight that have destroyed the relationship from 1930 till 1952. This was the prelude to putting the Egyptian uh, Copts outside the political spectrum. So what has happened briefly in that period to marginalize the Christians? I think honestly we will have- Sever, Several things I mentioned. I yeah. mentioned the, the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood. I mentioned the rise of the fascist movement of Masr al-Fatah and- uh, if you are here tomorrow, we can come to this. We have another se session with uh, uh, another speaker on the whole question of Coptic identity and minority identity. So thank you very much, Mia. It was amazing. Uh, <laughs> and we'll move on to the next item.